So now we're broadcasting to all attendees. So good evening and welcome to the latest masterclass of the John Schofield Trust. I'm Kate Riley, I'm a trustee, and it's a great pleasure to welcome to this week's podcast um, Georgia Cohn of the BBC, Shihab Khan of ITN, and Jaja Mohammed from Broccoli Content. Um, I've put um, a little poll up just so that you can let us know um, how you found out about the masterclass, which will help us massively with promotion. And I've put a little message in the chat box, which hopefully you can see about our campaign, which we launched this week um, to fundraise the first time we've ever done this uh, publicly. So um, if you could make a donation, that would be, we'd be fantastically grateful. Uh, we don't charge for anything that we do. Um, so without any further ado, I'm going to pass over to uh, Georgia, who's going to kick off tonight's session on podcasting. Over to you, Georgia. Okay. Thanks, Kate. Um, yeah, welcome everyone to uh, this masterclass on podcasting. And hopefully you'll learn lots of tips because we've got the best in the biz, some of the best in the biz here tonight. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to start off by sharing a little bit about how we got into journalism and how we also got into podcasting after. And uh, so we're all going to go around and kind of share our story. So first of all, I'll, I'll start and kick us off. So uh, my name is George Cohn and I work currently for the podcast unit at the BBC and um, I've been doing that technically um, for about, well, I've been working in podcasting now for about two years. Um, but I started in the BBC in 2016, I think it was now. Yeah, I think it was, yeah, 2016. So I was an apprentice and uh, I started on the digital journalism apprenticeship. So I was in local radio and was training in Free Counties Radio, which is near Luton, for 22 months altogether. Uh, I got my NCTJ, I got my qualifications and got all my training. And then towards the end of my apprenticeship, there was an opportunity to work on a pilot uh, for a podcast, which is now Beyond Today, which is a Radio 4 podcast. And uh, at that point, obviously didn't have a name. We didn't know what it was. Uh, that's how I met my, my colleague, Jar Jar, um, who now works at Broccoli Content. And uh, yeah, so we had this opportunity to go and work on a podcast for, I think it was a month all in all. So we created some pilot episodes and we launched this podcast. Uh, and it was just an amazing opportunity. And people asked me kind of how I got into podcasting. And if I'm honest with you, I, I fell into it, which sounds really strange, but I, I never really set out to go into podcasting, but I feel like it was a natural progression from what I was doing before because I was in radio and digital. So it kind of made sense that podcasting is kind of those two industries merged together. And so, yeah, I gravitated towards podcasting. And before I was working on Beyond Today, I'd never, or the, working on the pilot anyway, I'd never really heard about podcasts before. And uh, I started listening to all these podcasts whilst I was working on the pilot, you know, Radio Lab, um, This American Life, lots of these big American podcasts mainly. And yeah, I was just absolutely amazed by it. And I fell in love with it and became so passionate about the idea that you could tell stories in a longer format and create something that was not just a two minute package or something that was quite quick and fleeting in a sense um so yeah that's how that's how i got into podcasting i now work on the a podcast unit that creates newscasts in the next episode or previously um the next episode and uh yeah i love it and as i say been in it two years and uh, it's the best thing ever so i'm going to pass over to uh, shehab now who will obviously talk about his journey into podcasting yeah, so mine is ever so slightly different. So I'm currently a political reporter at ITV News. So my day job involves uh, standing outside Westminster, standing outside Downing Street and reporting on what's happening in the world of politics. So I primarily do television news. So I'll be on the bulletins uh, across the week during on lunch or evening at News at 10. That's what my focus is on. Now, I got into that essentially by being a newspaper journalist so really unusual route for me i came out of university i did some work experience at the independent uh, i did some more work experience and some more work experience and then eventually got offered a job and i was there for about three or four years uh, covering politics talking about news writing for the newspaper writing for the website and then i moved over into television uh, podcasting wasn't really something that itv was doing very much of when i started 
it's become a lot more popular. We're doing a lot more podcasts now. And it was during the election time that as a politics team, we decided that we needed something new, something exciting to, as Georgia says, to find a different way of telling a story because we primarily do lives and packages, but there was so much going on. There was so much interesting stuff happening. We had correspondence on the road. We had correspondence with Boris Johnson. We had correspondence with Jeremy Corbyn. We had people absolutely everywhere. And there was so much good stuff. And we didn't really know the best way to get it out there to a brand new audience. And we thought podcasts would be a fantastic way of doing that. So we launched this new podcast. It was myself, Robert Peston, ICV's political editor, and my colleague, Daniel Hewitt, the three of us. Uh, and we thought, what a fantastic way of just calling people, talking to them on the road, getting everything together. So we launched this daily podcast and it was super, super fun to do literally from not knowing anything about podcasts to launching something doing it every day and now we've been renewed we're doing an episode every week and it's been good fun so that's that's how i got into podcasting not a traditional route in but it's been good fun nonetheless um hi guys i hope that you're all well tonight um during this uh, period of time uh, of going back into lockdown um quote unquote um however um i'll go into how i got into podcasting so mine typically i would say it was kind of traditional so i started off in radio however i did start off in music radio um i was uh working at a community radio station as a music radio um, producer um and then i transitioned into news i fell i would say i fell into radio four and i was working on all the new sequence programs so today program world at one all the way up until world tonight and um yeah, I was, I was there as a researcher. I left um, to go back into music radio and then um, uh, came back to the BBC. And that was the point where, as Georgia said, I met Georgia, where they were doing a pilot for, uh, they basically framed it as the Today Programme's grandchild, so as a podcast. Um, so yeah, the target audience was a bit younger and just a bit more um, engaging. I think coming from a radio background as well, um, you always have to, was it cut your darlings? So you always have to cut out the great bits, um, well, the bits that you think are great um, and you wish that the listener could um, hear. So in a podcast, it's just, um, obviously it would, it would give you a, a chance to be able to put all of that good stuff into a longer format. So that I guess that that was the point of Beyond Today. So I was there for 18 months. Um, did quite a few different things there and um, left the BBC at the end of December um, going to the podcast production company called Broccoli um, where we solely make podcasts. Um, I would say that there's a huge difference between radio and podcasting. I thought egotistically that, you know, our radio is basically pod podcasting, but it's um, very, very different. So yeah, I'm now a producer there. Um, and that's been my journey. Um, and so gonna move on to the next bit where I will give you some tips and tricks. So I um, gen genuinely never planned out for my career to be um, in podcasting at all. I just wanted to be a music uh, producer. That was the goal. Um, and then moved through the industry um, in, the weirdest way. I never wanted to write. However, now I'm writing scripts and now I'm writing articles and that all comes within the whole podcasting world. I feel like when you are a podcast producer, there's so many roles that you take on, whether it be you have to learn how to record, you have to learn how to write a script, as I said, um, you have to learn how to cut, um, liaise with people. There's just so many different um, roles that you take on as a podcast producer or researcher or editor you end up doing it all. And especially because the podcasting industry is so young um, in the UK, I would say, um, we've basically, we're basically just mastering conversational podcasts. Um, so I think now is the time to start being um, creative. So I'll give you just, I'll say three top tips of um, how to navigate. Um, first of all, is networking. So when I was in music radio, we met loads of different people every single day. Um, you know, I would, I was a producer. So as a radio producer, you would speak to the guests, you'd get the guests in, you'd be speaking to the DJ and you're working with a lot of different people. 
you never know who you're going to meet um, in another world. So somebody that I worked in with in music, I may be working in in my news world. You know, if you're looking for somebody to contribute, so um, make sure you network and make sure you keep those networks strong and tight and try not to burn bridges with people because you you never want to see that, that person again in another in another world and feel like oh gosh I can't speak to that person. Also, one of the biggest things that I've um, learned because I haven't been a podcast producer for very long, um, I would say all in all about two years, but um, I've still got a lot to learn. I think one of the biggest things that I've learned about um, navigating and top top tips is um, just to diversify what you listen to in podcasting. So if you like music podcasts, don't just listen to music podcasts, you know, listen to um, person's podcast or listen to, um, you can listen to George's um, podcast, you know, and diversify, listen to things that you're not necessarily interested in so that you can get an idea of formatting. Um, there's a reason why, you know, for instance, even in the US, there's a large amount of genres of podcasts. So it's not just conversational. Um, I often encounter, I'm sure you guys do as well, when you tell somebody your job spec and, you know, you're saying, oh, I'm a podcast producer. People are like, oh, that's cute. However, there's a, there's a lot to it it's not just a conversation there's documentary style there's thrillers storylines you know those different ones and i would say the third thing about um about navigating and in the podcasting world that i've been learning of recent is just to read um just make sure you read lots um uh whether it's like you know if you want to get into podcasting or you want to get into film or tv or or um you know any avenue just make sure that you read up read up about it whether it's stories creative stories whether it's um tips and tricks whether it's something that could encourage you um confidence wise just making sure that you're um researching and um moving on so i believe that i'm going to go to shehab now before yeah, you no, do can I just interrupt before you do, um, this one question came in, which I thought you might want to answer, Jaja, which is um, how can you network during a pandemic? Um, Twitter is your friend. I got my job via Twitter. Um, I didn't see the person. I literally tweeted somebody um, who is at the top, um, one of the biggest shows on the BBC now. And I said, hi, can I get a contact for you? Um, I sent her my um, CV and she took the time. Nowadays, this is your platform. Zoom is your platform. Um, you can FaceTime. There's just so many, if you want to do it, you'll do it. And I think one of the things that um, you have to have is um, uh, no, I guess it's not no shame, but just like no inhibitions, because at the end of the day, if you really want something, you're going to go and get it. Um, so yeah, I tweeted people, I um, tuned into people's um, talks and um, I just showed a lot of interest. Um, so yeah, you can definitely do that. I think it's even better because everybody's on their phones. So yeah. Yeah, no, that, that's something I would definitely uh, encourage. I also have made a lot of the contacts I've made um, in both politics and in journalism just through social media. I think it is the new way of networking. And Jar Jar's right, everyone is at home at the moment. Everyone is looking at their phones. Everyone is on their laptops and computers. Now is probably the easiest time to actually get people to respond to you because people are stuck at home, locked down with not much to do. Uh, I'm gonna talk you through some of the stuff we've done on our podcast, Calling Peston, um, and why I think it's an incredible platform just to do new and interesting things. So ITV generally has always focused on the news bulletins. That's been its sort of number one priority. Millions of people watch it, it's on national TV. We get amazing access to politicians, to some of the best news stories. And what we wanted to do with this podcast was, like Jaja said, there are so many different types of podcasts and we wanted to do a news podcast that was a little bit different. So if you have listened to ours, it's not so much here's everything that's happened during the week. What we were trying to do was give you the different side of politics. So we would call during the election, for example, Paul Brand, who's our political correspondent that was bedded in with Boris Johnson on his bus as he traveled around the country. We'd call him, we'd ask him what he had for lunch. We'd ask him what the prime minister was eating. We'd ask him what was going on when the cameras were turned off 
and press officers were hounding him and telling him what's going to happen. We wanted to get a feel for all those things that you don't get to see when you're watching the news. And that was a real emphasis that we put on during that little period. And from the feedback that we got, people found it really interesting. We were talking about things that you wouldn't otherwise know. And you can't put that into a news bulletin. When you've got half an hour at 6.30 to talk about everything in the news, there's no way you're going to mention what the Prime Minister was doing on the back of the bus as he's planning for his next trip. But we were able to do that because podcast gave us sort of a different platform and a different way of doing that. Um, something else which was really interesting for us, because we hadn't done a political podcast before, we were learning as we were going on. It was changing and adapting. Um, I could see a question from Evan Hall where he asked, in terms of political podcasting, how do you avoid the trap of a political podcast being a long-form interview with a politician without a video? And that is... Honestly, one of the conversations we had at the very beginning, we said, the one thing we don't want this podcast to be is a one-on-one -on -one interview with a politician where you're not seeing us and you're just listening to us talk for half an hour. So to get around that, we made sure there were several segments throughout. We had one bit with Robert Pesson where we'd call him, we'd get his analysis. We'd have another bit where Dan, my co-host and I, would talk through some of the things that we'd done and we'd seen. And then we'd talk to a guest, we'd keep it really short, we'd try our best to keep it informal, going back and forth, trying to essentially do a different style to the Paxman style interview where you're shouting at someone because ultimately that doesn't really work when you're listening because you're not seeing the human interaction, you're not seeing the facial expressions. A lot of it is about the conversation and the way in which you bounce off each other. Um, but again, the way we've done the podcast over the last few months, we've done loads of different things. We've done it all over the country. We've done episodes in Manchester. We've done episodes in London. We've done, because of the lockdown, episodes in our bedroom some of us have been in other countries and we've done episodes like that and it's been great and during the election we got to do that as well so there were a couple of episodes in the election which really demonstrated how you can do podcasts in a very different way uh, after the leaders debate where Boris Johnson and Jeremy Corbyn went up against each other uh, on ITV we were backstage and we actually did an episode backstage and we had politicians who were there, we had audience members who were there and we were bringing them in and we were just asking them what they thought and we essentially did a live episode backstage getting reaction for the debate and as soon as the debate finished we put it straight up on the website, we put it straight up on Spotify and iTunes so people then had the opportunity to watch the debate, watch it live on TV and then go on their phones and have a listen to everything that happened backstage and it was great and it was a really different way of doing it and we did a similar thing on election night on election night dan and i were in the election newsroom as the results were coming in we were doing live reactions to it we pulled it all together in the morning so then when people went into work they were able to listen to a 20 minute episode which hour by hour went through everything that happened in the night which a lot of people would have missed because people are normal and they go to sleep through the night but dan and i stayed up and watched absolutely everything I think that's one of the good things about podcasts. You can do loads of different things in loads of different ways. You can get guests on, you can do quizzes, you can do all sorts. And it gives you a lot of freedom that you wouldn't otherwise get with other platforms. And I think that's one of the great things. In terms of making it original, it's hard. There are so many podcasts out. Jar Jar touched on that quite a few times. There's loads of different podcasts. There's loads of different genres. And I think above anything else, personality is really important. Be yourself, keep, make sure you, if you're hosting one on your own, make sure your personality comes out, talk about the things you're interested in. If you have a co-host, make sure you get on with them really well because you're going to be in that podcast room for a long period of time. And if you don't get on, it's going to be really obvious. So that's really key. And that's what makes it really, really different. Lockdown has obviously made everything a lot harder. I think George is going to touch on that in a second. We have been doing podcasts at the start of lockdown. We've paused for a bit now and we were doing it via Zoom often getting guests on via Zoom, talking to them via Zoom. And it's different. It's a lot more difficult when you're not in the same room as someone. But still, a lot of the podcasts that have come out during lockdown have been fantastic. And I think George is going to touch on that a little bit more. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, our team have pretty much exclusively been making podcasts from home since the end of March, I think it, it's been. So apart from with newscast where some of our presenters have been in the studio because we've had to maybe visualise an interview, we've had to do something in the studio, we've pretty much been producing podcasts from home. And actually the great thing about podcasting and something that I always talk to people about is the fact that with podcasting, there is this DIY element to it where you can, regardless of who you are, regardless of your skill set, you can set up your own podcast. And a lot of the time, yes, okay, to make it the best it can be, you might want to 
you know do some courses here and there to learn a little bit more about editing or a little bit more about how to uh, record stuff in a certain way or the right equipment to use but pretty much you have this opportunity to create something and put content out there in a way that you don't have to be sponsored or to get money from a massive company to be able to do it. And so when we started making podcasts in March, we kind of had this worry that it was going to be really difficult because obviously we work in the office. Uh, we work in a very collaborative way that means we're constantly bouncing ideas off of each other. And I think that part of it sometimes can be difficult when you're working from home. But actually, generally, it's it's not that difficult to do. And I think a lot of people were doing very similar stuff beforehand. and were probably making podcasts from home because actually it's a lot cheaper and maybe uh, a lot better in terms of time. And, you know, the fact that if you want to have a conversation with someone and they say, oh, well, I don't finish work until six, you say, all right, then let's set up a Zoom call and we can record it over Zoom. So I actually personally think that it's going to create an environment that more more people can get involved in podcasting and more people can um, create their own product, which I think is, a, is an amazing opportunity. Um, but yeah, for us, we've been doing stuff over, um, well, we've been using mainly Zencaster, uh, either Zencaster or Zooms to record the actual interview and to do interviews. Um, but there's lots of different ways that you can do it. So for example, I've kind of got a setup here, what, you know, as I'm sitting here now, where I have my desk, I've got all my stuff in front of me, I've got my laptop. So I use something called Hindenburg to edit our podcast and put it together um, but then I've got you know some road mics here so they're relatively cheap as well I'm not obviously other mics are available so you don't have to just go with road I'm not sponsored by them um, but you know this, a mic like this won't set you back too much and actually in a way is an investment you know if you want to create something if you want to make a podcast of your own um, you know investing in a good mic I think is the best thing that you can do because you can get free editing software online Audacity is a great one if you want a free editing um, platform that you can start putting your podcast together. But, you know, something like this, a mic like this and Zencaster or some kind of recording um, setup that it's basically a website where you go on there and the other person then logs onto their computer and you can speak to each other and it records it on both sides. So you get the best quality um, recording that you can get rather than kind of a little bit if the internet drops out and you start to get a little bit of a bad um, basically it's, it's, it doesn't sound very good the audio won't sound great so that's the way that we've been doing it is we've actually found that it's quite easy to transition from working in an office to working from home when you work in audio because you're in a position where you can do stuff from home and you can record and equipment is relatively cheap. Um, for example, you know, I always say to people, people say, oh, do I have to go out and buy a mic? And I say, actually, you don't because you can get voice memos on your phone. If you're talking to someone else on Zoom, what you do is you put your headphones in, put your voice memos on, put that right next to you and you're both recording on your end and you just splice them together basically when you're editing you put them together it's going to sound amazing it's going to sound probably just as good as, as say a road mic um so you don't have to have the best equipment you don't have to put lots of money into it you can have a small budget and still create an amazing podcast um but yeah that's how we've been putting together our podcast in lockdown and actually we've seen not a massive difference in quality from when we were doing it in in the studio so I think that actually this is an opportunity for people to really be able to take those skills and create something whilst you've got this amazing opportunity where, as I say, people are now using Zoom and using all these different um, kind of recording recording setups and stuff to be able to make something at home so I personally have found it more helpful and have probably gained a lot more skills because of this so um, yeah it's something that obviously I'm really passionate about and um, yeah I, I think it's something that all of us at home can really look into and we can maybe do a few courses here and there and really start to get our skills up in this time so but then I'm, I'm now going to move on to something which is probably potentially going to put you off podcasting. Potentially not, because obviously we'll save it. Um, but we're going to talk about podcasting mistakes. Um, so I don't know whether maybe, Jaja, if you want to go and you want to talk about a podcast mistake that you've made in your time as a podcast producer, and then we go round and she have, and then obviously maybe I can finish it off for us. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Georgia. Um, 
my podcast and disaster happened actually literally like uh two months ago and what it was is that we were recording via zoom I had asked um, the person of interest whether they had a recorder and they said, yeah, we've got a recorder. I've got a recorder and um, I record from my end. And then they said, when we got to there, um, when we got to the point where we were going to record, it was a, supposed to be like a interview that was going to be an hour. Um, he said, oh, I'll record on my, my laptop. So I said, um, I'm not too sure if the recording will be as good as your, your audio recorder, but, you know, um, let's go for it. Um, we got to the end of the conversation, which was a brilliant conversation. We had a great time. Our presenter had a great time. And I said, okay, cool. So if you just send me that recording. And he said, you're joking. So basically he didn't record any of his side at all. Um, <laughs> so in all in all, I was just like, okay, what are we going to do? Because um, he's a very busy man. He, we've just been talking for about an hour and a bit, but luckily um, he was really lovely. And he didn't ask, um, he, he didn't say that he wouldn't be able to do it again. So we just did, did it again. Um, but I think one of the things that I've definitely learned, especially in this, pro, in, this, in this period of time, is just to have like a checklist of, are you recording? Am I recording? Are they recording? Okay, cool. And just make sure that that's done. And to go off the back of what Georgia said, iPhones are, are great. So you don't need to have a 200 pound um, recording device. All you need is your iPhone or your phone. If you um, have listened to Generation Windrush, the podcast that I did myself um, in April, um, majority of the people, all of my, no, all of my contributors recorded their interviews on iPhones. Um, I had like a, um, I think I was the only one who had a professional mic um, because I do work for a podcast company, but everything was iPhone. So um, think about the content rather than the quality. Um, and yeah, so I'll go to Shehab because yeah, that was embarrassing. <laughs> um, so we, we have a studio, a professional studio, uh, and it's in Millbank in Westminster. Um, and it's near where if you ever watch Sky or BBC and um, they're doing lives from Westminster, that's often where they're based. They're all based in the same building. And we were in the midst of the election. Uh, we were doing uh, a podcast every single day and we'd start recording at about two o'clock. It would go out at about five o'clock and we'd all turned up at two o'clock and there was a gas leak in Millbank and we couldn't get in. And all of our kits, all of our editing software, absolutely everything that we need to do the podcast is inside this building and the police had cordoned it all off and we couldn't get in and we had nothing to do. And it came on a week where we'd been building up to this final episode we were going to do at the end of the week where we had a big guest that was supposed to come on and we'd already done the bit with the guest. So we'd pre-recorded that the day before. So that was ready. And we had no idea what to do. And both Georgia and Jaja have mentioned that iPhone is a fantastic bit of kit. So we had no choice. What we did is we got in a car, we went to uh, our other office, which is in Grayson Road. The three of us sat around with our iPhones and we essentially, exactly as Georgia said, put our headphones in, put the voice memo thing on, had a chat, tried to meld it together. And we said at the very beginning, if any of this sounds off, if it doesn't sound how we usually sound, it's because there's been a massive gas leak and we managed to get through, we managed to make it work, but it was probably one of the more stressful hours that I've had during the podcasting uh, experience. The flip side of it is since then, we've got some backup kits, we've got some portable kits uh, and we've got them spread out across loads of different offices and loads of different places. So if it ever happens again, uh, we do have backups. But I think beyond anything, it does show you you need to be flexible. You need to be ready to think on your feet. We've had moments where guests have fallen through, where we're a day away from recording or sometimes hours away from recording and we've set everything up and we're ready to do it. And then someone's pulled out and you just have to change your plans really quickly. Um, and sometimes you don't need a guest. I mean, it, it goes from podcast to podcast. We've had episodes where we haven't had a guest because we've just thought we've not needed one. And you can often make things work with a podcast in ways that you couldn't do in other forms of journalism because it is a lot more flexible. There's no real structure to it that is so regimented that you have to follow it. When things change, when things are different, you can be flexible. You can do things in an innovative an interesting way and often I found the episodes that I listen to where there's a disclaimer at the start that says things are going to be a bit different because we've had x y and z happen they tend to be the best ones they tend to be the most engaging because you sort of let loose from that structure that you've sometimes confined yourself into and you're able to be yourself you're able to do more interesting things and I think that's the best way to get around it uh, I think Georgia's got quite an interesting experience that of something that went wrong so let's listen to that 
Oh yeah, so I <laughs> I made a rookie error, and this was probably a month before lockdown. Maybe it was the last episode that I'd worked on. So um, I I worked on a podcast called the Next Episode, which was aimed towards uh, kind of working class audiences, underserved audiences across the country. So under um, what eighteen to twenty five was our demographic, and I'd been working on an episode that was about LGBT plus homelessness. And it was a really interesting episode and we had traveled all the way to, I think it was Falmouth actually. So we traveled quite a long way from London to Falmouth to do an interview with um, this young person who had an experience and basically we were doing an interview. Um, this was a case study that we booked to speak to. And I booked out all this equipment. So at the BBC, we tend to use, um, basically it's like a, a Zoom mic. So you have like the, the recorder and then you have you know one or two mics that you can switch in and that you can give to your um, presenter and your guest so I've taken the full equipment to do this interview and we traveled there did the interview I always like to make sure that I do a little test beforehand to make sure everything's working so I would recommend that as well that's another tip is make sure that you do a little test so even if it's like recording for 10 seconds and then just saying a few words into the mic and then checking it to make sure it's saving onto the SD cards because that's another issue is that with saving stuff to SD cards sometimes it's not saved in the right place or it's you know it can be named something else that you don't realize and that obviously makes it easier when you take that and you ingest that um, information in afterwards. So I checked, um, you know, I checked the levels, everything was recording. And what happened was I then went home and um, I made the mistake. I'd taken a few SD cards with me. That's another tip that I can give you is like when you go to record stuff, take as many SD cards as possible, but make sure to organize them so you know which one you've recorded on. Because I had a situation where I put all the SD cards in my coat pocket which is not very professional and I would not tell you to do that. Um, but I put them all in my pocket and that I'd taken the coat home and the next morning to go into work, I'd stuck my hand in the pocket, taken the SD cards that were in one pocket and I'd just taken them to work. Anyway, I then get to work and I start trying to um, download this stuff. So what I should have done is I should have taken it off the SD card on the train journey home like a normal person would. But for some reason, I was just tired. I was feeling a bit over, over I don't know, I think I'd, I'd worked a few over hours that week or whatever. So um, I was feeling a bit tired and I obviously didn't do that on the train journey home, which usually I would do. And uh, I got this SD card and I was looking and I could not find this audio and I was freaking out because this was our main case study, right? And we traveled all the way to Falmouth to get this interview so i was looking through all this stuff couldn't find it and i was just freaking out i was going to it and i was saying to them please try and get this off the sd card is there a way to retrieve the the audio because i've lost it i was completely freaking out anyway uh, i realized i i'd come to the conclusion that obviously it had gone right i'd either deleted it I'd, because i'd not taken it off it was gone i checked these three sd cards that i'd taken out of my coat pocket um i then decided that's it right i've 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 effed this up basically and um, I've just got to live with it and realise that I've made a massive mistake and learn from that mistake for next time. I then get home and I, I think to myself, well, I might just check the other pocket to just see, you know, maybe I maybe there's something else in there. Anyway, I look in this pocket and what do I find? The SD card with the audio on. So I'd spent all day basically thinking I'd lost this audio when it was on the SD card in the other pocket. So what I'll, I'll say to you, and this is a great, I think this is a great tip and one that I will obviously take with me for future reference, is to organize your SD cards, try and remember which one you've put the audio on and um, don't don't freak out basically do not freak out you you know you could have lost something but i think every mistake that we make leads to us learning from that mistake and being better producers and journalists so and i think you know as the guys have said this i think everything that you do you have to adapt to it and there are ways that you can still do it even if something happens last minute where you think oh my god we're not going to be able to do this i've i've messed this up there is other ways that you can adapt to that and that you can 
still make an amazing podcast. So uh, yeah, that's my mistake and how I rectified it at the end, which is I think pure luck really, but you know, these, these things happen and, and that's all part of the, of the journey of podcasting. Um, so yeah, I think what we're going to do now is we're going to move into some questions. So there's a few questions that I think were sent beforehand and obviously a few people have put them into the chat as well. So Kate, I don't know whether you wanted to kind of put those to each of us. Yeah, I think the, um, some of the questions, a couple of questions came in beforehand and one of them was about scripting and I've noticed there's a few questions about scripting. Um, what do you need to keep in mind when preparing the script for an episode of an interview type podcast? And then somebody else has asked, um, let me just find it about scripting. Uh, sorry. I think it was more about, can you give an, an idea of a script? So uh, yes, an example of a script. How do you get the conversation to flow? So maybe she had, that would be a good one for you. Yeah, so we, we try to get guests on our podcast as often as possible. Uh, obviously, because it's a politics podcast, it tends to be politicians. Uh, we've had loads of people. We've had senior members of the cabinet on. We've had uh, former politicians on. We've had people like Alistair Campbell. He's featured on the podcast a fair few times. Uh, during the Labour leadership election, we had all the candidates on Vincent Kistama. He was supposed to come on, but we couldn't get a time to work. So we had... Emily Thornbury, Lisa and Andy, uh, Jess Phillips. And the key thing with that, especially when there's two of us, so both Dan and I, we do the interviewing together. The key thing that we try to emphasize before, so we go away, we'd have a chat and we'd say, look, this is a really important interview that we're gonna do. These are the things that people wanna hear about. These are the things they want to know. But crucially, these are the things that wouldn't get asked when they're on TV. And these are the things that they wouldn't have the opportunity to talk about in more detail when they are sitting in a studio talking to one of the news anchors. So that's what we did. That's the approach that we took. So if you go back and listen to those episodes, some of the questions are very predictable. They're the ones that you'd expect us to ask because we can't ask, we can't not ask the really obvious ones. But often the conversation would start to flow and we'd start to ask questions which were a bit different. They were a bit more personal. They were a bit more about what these people were like away from politics. And we'd have a conversation about it. And often we'd instead of just responding with another question, we'd end up having a conversation. And I remember with Lisa and Andy, Dan and I started talking about food that she'd have in Wigan. We'd start talking about our producer, Lewis, he's from Middlesbrough. We were talking about food in Middlesbrough. We were comparing those two things. I wouldn't do that if I was doing a normal interview uh, for ITV, if she was sat in front of me, that's not the style or approach that I would take. And that's usually the best way to make it flow. You can simultaneously, have a conversation with someone, ask difficult questions if they're a politician and that's what the podcast is there for, but also draw out different answers and draw out sort of different experiences purely because of the way the platform is designed. In terms of scripting, I think the one thing that I would say, especially with podcasts is I think, and I know everyone has their own styles, it's important not to over script. Have a few topics that you wanna to talk about, have things that you really think are important that need to be in there, but don't read it off the bit of paper as if you're talking off a teleprompter. Make sure you're being flexible. Make sure you're being responsive. The worst interviews are when someone says something and you don't respond directly to it and you just go on to your next question and it just sounds like a Q&A. What you want it to feel like, especially when you're doing a podcast, because remember, people usually aren't watching it. They're just listening to it. You need it to be more conversational. You need to respond to what the person says. You need to come back and sort of try and make it as conversational as possible. Um, I just see another question in there about how to get people to come on. I initially, when we set up the podcast, that was one of the concerns we raised. We didn't know how flexible people would be. And we found people are really keen because it's quite easy to do. Um, obviously as the presenter we're in the studio but we can phone people up we can talk to people via zoom we can talk to people by skype by facetime and we can patch them through to the studio and record them and people tend to be quite keen because you can do it on the go you don't have to be in a specific place at a specific time you need 10 15 minutes free um so it's not the most inconvenient thing on the planet it's fairly easy especially if you've got a podcast that's been built up and obviously we're in a really fortunate position or we've got ITV that's uh, pushing the podcast and we've had uh, a lot of funding that's gone into it and a lot of time that's been spent on graphics and advertising and stuff. So it's quite easy for us to get people on. But in terms of the inconvenience, it is fairly limited, I think. Um, there's quite a few questions around pitching. So there's, you know, how do you pitch a podcast idea? There's somebody who's asked a very specific question about, um, they've, they've been researching crime story. Um, 
is it like pitching a book they said where you might benefit from an agent uh how do you um rosie had one i think about uh pitching ideas oh, i've lost it now where's it gone <laughs> anyway pitching so uh Zha Zha, do you want to start off with pitching um i would probably say that that would be george's george's lane Okay. <laughs> especially, especially yeah. not I saw a music question so if yeah. you want me to go for the music question I think somebody asked about um, okay. the you do, do that while Georgia thinks about the answer yeah. to yeah sorry to put you on the spot Georgia yeah. um, <laughs> um, but I think yeah I don't know where the music question is but it said something like how do you um, go from music to yeah, um, music um, and I thought that's, that's a really good question because there was a lot of judgment um, being very honest um, there is a the I would say that there is a bit of a uh, uh, okay I'm gonna be plain I felt like it was snobbery um, primarily because news is like serious you know it's like you have to be updated on something that is um, you know, it's, it's, it's the updates, it's something that is really, you know, it's really important and music is looked at, you know, entertainment, it's not necessarily necessary. However, in, in, in the world, you know, uh, music is very, very important. In, in the, in the grand, grand scheme of things, music is very important. Um, so I had to, personally, I had to reassure myself that my work, that I'd, I'd worked in music radio for about five years at the time of going to, um, the, in, into the news industry um going from music to news people don't necessarily look um treat you as though you've got any experience at all so you have to just be like confident within yourself and just say i've got experience and these are transferable skills you know bidding for people asking people to come onto the show asking good questions you know you do the same thing i guess it's just the topic that's different um so i think um the adjust adjustment there are there are different like um, I would say there's there's like um what do they call it like there's media speak there's like journal journal language you know like um, yeah. law huh the jargon media jargon yeah 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 media jargon I had no clue about half of the things that I was you know people were talking to me about but I would say okay or I would say what does that mean um and then you just like you pick it up within within I would say two to three months you'll pick up um whatever you need to pick up you read what these people are reading you talk to the people you ask you ask questions um, and then you'll you'll figure it out so the adjustment isn't as great um if you're thinking about it um if, if you're going to be worried about it you 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 will be you will be scared really and truly but if you're just going to say i'm going to put my head in and i'm going to go for it you will get it. so that was the answer that's the answer to that one um over to you george <laughs> Pitching, yes. Uh, I've done a lot of pitching actually in the last few months, so I feel like I'm in a position to talk about this. Uh, so working on the podcast the last two years and having, especially now in our podcast unit, we have all these different products that that basically our, our team makes. So we've got newscasts, we've we had the next episode, um, Beyond Today is now under our team as well. So we have all these different products, and Americas as well, I can't forget Americas. So we have all these different products that our team make. And I think the best thing that I can tell you when it comes to pitching is make sure your pitch is catered to whatever department or whatever organization it is that you're pitching it to. Uh, obviously I can only speak from the BBC point of view because that's been where I've been working since 2016. So so it's something that I have over the years pitched to different departments and different places within the BBC. And I found that actually when you write a pitch, what you want to do is you want to be very concise, but you also want to make sure that you've got the right information in there. So with podcasting, if you want to create a podcast that's a news podcast, you might you might go to say Radio 4 or you might go to our units, the BBC News podcast unit to pitch that idea. But if you were maybe looking for, to pitch an idea that was a little bit more featurey or, um, you know, was more, say, something that Radio 1 podcast would create or something along those lines, then you might go to BBC Sounds and ask the commissioner at BBC Sounds about the idea. 
uh, but obviously there are independent companies that you can go through as well. So you might want to pitch an idea to an, in, an indie and the indie might then go and pitch that to say BBC or ITV or other larger organizations. So I think the, the great thing about podcasting is that because it's so popular at the moment and so many people are really catching on to it, I feel like, you know, Jaja and I, when we started off at Beyond Today, I would say in that moment, that's when podcasting in the UK was starting to become a big thing. While as before, I, I would say it always has been quite big, but I feel like some people thought it was a bit niche because you used to have like the Ricky Gervais podcast and those types of things where people didn't necessarily know what a podcast was, but they would listen to podcast because a celebrity was behind it or because there was some kind of big name. While as I feel like podcasting has become an integral part of our everyday lives in a sense now you know we we listen to daily podcasts say like newscasts or beyond today those types of podcasts where we want to find out about what's happened during the week or we want to find out about a really important news story that's been dissected over a 20 minute episode um, and I feel like it's definitely become more popular in the last few years and what that does is it means that when you're pitching ideas it's it's one it's it's difficult because obviously there's so many different ideas out there that might have been done so it means that it might be a bit more difficult to create an original idea but it also gives you a lot more creative freedom because the great thing about a podcast is that you can pretty much within reason do anything with it you know you might want to do an investigation so the missing crypto queen you know if you listen to that that is an investigation into um into one particular person and their activities and and their life story basically so you might want to pitch a podcast that focuses on one character or you might want to do a podcast that focuses on um one particular story and follows through as a series so that's the great thing is that you have this freedom when you pitch a podcast to be able to go down all these different avenues and do things in a different way that you wouldn't necessarily be able to do with radio or you wouldn't be able to do with a documentary. So that's the great thing I think about, about this is that there is so much creative freedom in it. But yes, when you're writing pitches, make sure that you're catering it to whatever department or whatever organization you're sending that pitch to and make sure it's, I would say no longer than, um you know one sheet of paper and you put all the maybe the guests that you want to have on there or a, a maybe like a free paragraph pitch as to exactly what it is that you want to do with this podcast and why it's original to anything else that's out there um yeah that's the, that's the tips that i would give there's a question from emma she says how long would you recommend giving yourself between devising a concept to recording and release Oh, that's a good question. That's a really good question. I think it depends. It depends what you're doing. So if you're doing an investigative podcast, you might be recording months in advance because that's the, that's the great thing as well about podcasting is that you, that you can get all those little bits and bobs that you don't usually get with other, you know, you wouldn't get with TV or you wouldn't get with radio. So you might be working on an investigation where you're going to record every little element of what happens whilst you're traveling to that place to meet that person, or you're going to record you um, looking someone up online or doing research into someone that you, that is part of the podcast. So I would say that it really depends. For example, I would give an example of um, an episode that I worked on for um, the next episode, which was about a inpatient care facility up north, um, a CAMS inpatient facility, where there had been a number of deaths over a certain period of time. And I just decided it was a subject that I was really interested in, but I decided that I really wanted to do an episode about it and investigate into what was happening. And so I would say from the moment I conceived the idea to the moment it went out, probably took about four months, I would say, three or four months. And the reason was because it was a proper investigation. So, you know, I did an FOI, um, a freedom of information request. I then built up relationships with the families beforehand. So I wanted to find out kind of about the people that had been involved in this and the people that had unfortunately lost their lives and get kind of a little bit more insight into who they were. So I built up that relationship over a few months and I built up that story. And all the time I was recording it, you know, recording telephone conversations or recording recording myself kind of 
investigating or looking up stuff online to try and find a little bit more out about this particular hospital and so I would say that with something like that it's going to take a bit longer but um, get, basically nothing is nothing amazing is made overnight do you know what I mean sometimes it takes time especially with the documentaries and the longer form types of podcasting you, you, you want to make it the best it can be and if that means that you can see the idea in a few months down the line you then make it and it goes out it's it's about patience and wanting that product to be the best thing it can be so sometimes it takes time but that's that's kind of part of the industry I think Great. So um, there's quite a few questions about gap in the market. Any of you think of a gap in the market? Uh, I think there's quite a few about, you know, what's the gap for young people, I suppose, as well. George, do you want to take that? Um, I, 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 don't, I think educational podcasts. I like, I, I, I crave information. I don't know about you. Like I would have loved a podcast, like a bite-sized podcast. Like when I was doing my, my, you know, exams at, in year six, I would have loved a bite-sized podcast because I would have been told everything in a 20 minute podcast about, I don't know how the body works. Do you know what I mean? Like you don't have to research in loads of different books and go online and do your research and things like that. Like, I just think you have to identify it yourself, really. Like, I can't tell you what it is because there may be a podcast that is an educational podcast and tells you all about how the body works. Um, but I think just be creative and identify something that you're really passionate about. So for instance, like it could be about three of your mates who like to, um, I don't know, go fishing. And you guys have really, really great conversations whilst you're fishing. And it's just like a, I don't know, you, you, uh, something I don't know it could be something very very interesting like that also one of the things that I did want to mention is that um podcasts should be um thought about whenever you're developing anything so for instance if you're reading a book um sorry if you're writing a book apologies if you're writing a book you should be thinking ah oh, a podcast would be a great accompany accompaniment for that or you're creating a film and you're thinking, okay, I might have to cut out loads of different things in the film. So I'll put that in the podcast or, you know, things get edited and then there is like a podcast that could go aside of it. If you think about, um, like you watch your favorite film. So, um, uh, what's that film? Midsummer, that crazy film that's like three hours that's shot somewhere. Like I would have loved a podcast going into depth of, you know, who the actors were, what their former, um, roles were who the directors were and what kind of films but you know I'll do that myself and I'll go on IMDB but it would have been great if the directors or the I don't know the marketing team would have said okay this podcast is going to come out um uh you know straight after and then we're going to have interviews with these people and that people so those people so I think that that's a gap in the market um if you get on that that'd be great you make a lot of money so we've got um, Kirsty, who's an assistant producer on <laughs> Bite Size, is going to pass on your idea. <laughs> okay, um, how to hook an audience with a podcast? Who wants to take that one? I don't. I don't mind. She have a you? Do you want to mention something or? Yeah. So with ours, um, again, we launched our podcast at a time where politics was probably the most interesting thing that was going on it was right at the start of the general election um you could see on sort of every analytics bit of research that was done by anyone uh within our team was that people were google searching about politics almost every day it was all over the news it was all over the newspapers um general elections are like that it sort of takes over the news cycle for a few weeks launching a podcast then to talk about politics seemed like a good idea and it did we managed to build an audience extremely quickly it only took two or three episodes before the numbers got quite big uh, and that was purely because it was really topical at the time and what Jar Jar said about podcasts accompanying something else that was the key premise of our podcast it was we weren't trying to give you brand new news lines we weren't trying to give you the news in an hour or in half an hour what we were doing was alongside the news programs that were going out we were giving you a back sort of backstage view of what happened we were talking to the politicians after they'd done really serious interviews about how their day had been we were talking to correspondents who were on the road about 
how things were going, what was going on. That was the idea of it. In terms of sort of captivating an audience, we're not telling a story, we're not really doing investigations. What captivated the audience for us was the fact that politics was really interesting and we were essentially taking you through day by day everything that was going on and essentially what we were trying to do was give you something to take away, something you've learned, something that you wouldn't have otherwise known and above everything else we thought the way we thought about it was there will be people who are interested in politics but ultimately their day-to-day -day lives mean they can't watch the news all day, they can't follow every twist and turn. What they can do is on their way home from work put their headphones in for 15, 20 minutes at the start of our podcast, we can just tell them everything that's happened in that day that's fairly interesting. We can give them an alternative view. And that was the point of it. That's how we captivate the audience. In terms of building upon that, good content, good episodes, interesting stuff, new ideas. We engage with our audience quite a lot. We get quite a few emails sent in. We try our best to respond to most of them. Um, we've had a few people send in suggestions, we've had a few people send in quiz questions, so we've tried our best to engage with our audience as much as we can and try and build a rapport with them. Uh, and I think that's the best way. It's, it is hard. That is the most difficult thing. Launching the podcast is the easy bit. The difficult bit is getting people interested. And the even more difficult bit is keeping them interested. And it's tough. And I'm not going to pretend that there's any easy... Uh, instruction manual that you need to follow to be a huge success in this it's, it is really difficult we are still learning every single episode we're trying to figure out the best way to do it um, I assume Jarja and Jordan are in the same boat that every time they do an episode they're thinking oh that bit didn't work as well as other bits that bit was quite good what can we do better how can we make more people listen to this what is the right recipe no one knows but you have to keep trying you have to keep trying to be innovative and the best thing you can do is engage with the audience be yourself and then hopefully people will listen mm. I was just going to quickly add to that as well, if that's okay. Um, I feel like when you know who your audience are, I always say the best way to do it is almost have an example of who your audience is. So pick like one person. So I know they do it in local radio where they say June from Brighton, who is this age and likes this stuff. But if you can create a profile of who you think your audience is or who you think, you, you know, this one specific person who you think will be listening to your podcast, it's actually really, really helpful because sometimes, you know, on our podcast, the next episode, we were aiming it towards working class people um, outside of London, 18 to 20 and sometimes that could be quite difficult because we didn't know that obviously that's quite a broad range of people and when you're trying to maybe focus certain stories on certain communities of people you want to really hit the nail on the head and really understand the audience that you're trying to, to um, communicate with and so I would say that's the best way to do it is have an idea of exactly who that person is create a profile what do they like what other podcasts would they be listening to what books would they be reading what shows would they be watching just have an idea of exactly who it is that you want to get to aim the audience at and that allows you to then make sure that you're catering all of your content to, to that person and that audience and there's quite a few questions about around marketing a podcast and specifically about marketing on social media any thoughts on that um i think um, similar to what Georgia said, is just thinking about the person, um, who you're marketing to, uh, what were, what will they be into, um, where would they shop in regards to you know clothing or what they're going to eat or you know uh, think about like who you, who you are targeting. Um, and as she have said as well, like there's no magic formula. Like there's been so many people who've asked me, how do I get people to listen? Like genuinely we had no clue <laughs> we had no clue how we were going to get people interested into in this podcast but i think um personally um marketing you have to you have to make it sound look exciting so like i hardly follow um podcasts um on instagram i don't really follow them because they don't provide any good content for me to be following um but i may follow a page that has memes or you know or i may follow a page that has like something that i can take away or something that is like interesting for me that i can feel like oh i learned that on instagram or i learned that on twitter or that's a really great quote that i can use so if there's something that somebody won't be able to find elsewhere but they can find on your page and um, whether it's your instagram because obviously instagram is more visual you have to think about great pictures what works on instagram on instagram um animals work you know good looking food 
Yeah, I said good, good looking food. Food that looks good. Um, you know, people who look great, hipsters, you know, whatever, travel, pictures. You have to think about all of the things that go viral. Um, you kind of have to tap into psychology of marketing. Um, and again, there's no like, answer to say oh yeah this is the formula and you're going to have a great podcast because they could interact with your content on social media on instagram on twitter but they will never listen to your podcast and the whole point is listen to the podcast um one of the things that i want i think i wanted to touch on uh she have and um, what she have and, and georgia said about podcasts as well and um and getting people to listen um, one of the things that we really, really tried hard um, to do with Beyond Today was to make people come back. And that was with the structure. So knowing that it's no longer than 25 minutes, so you can use that on your commute, you can listen to that on your commute, knowing that you're going to have the intro from Matthew or Tina, and then you're going to have the outro from Matthew or Tina, like things that are, you know, like you when you watch a, a uh, a really great program I don't know maybe it's like a sitcom or a series you know what's going to come in you know it's like 20 minutes you know that there's going to be some mishap that's going to happen and you know they're going to recover it's kind of like um when you when you know that something's coming up you're waiting for it and you're engaged just like a psychology right and I, I've heard also that if you see something a certain amount of times um you will uh, you will recognize it and it will be something that you will um, interact with. So just make sure that you are, okay, one of the things I'll definitely say is cross promo. Um, so making sure that you network with, and again, back to the networking point, and make sure you network with other people who are in your field. So I think Olivia earlier on asked the question about social media, right? And she asked, um, she said that it's pretty crowded, podcast market is pretty crowded. As Georgia said, you can do your podcast on, on anything that you like. Um, there will be a podcast that hasn't been um, covered like topic, -wi topic wise and um, just go for it. And in that market, whether it's something that you've already done, um, there's so many different versions of like burgers. How many burger joints are there that, you know, and they're all making money. Um, so you can provide a service that's similar to somebody else, but do cross promo with them. So if your podcast is about bird watching, go to another person's bird watching podcast and co-present or be a guest on there. And then they'll be a guest on yours or do a shout out or just like you'll get some of their followers and you will offer something that's a little bit different from them because you're a totally different human being. But um, network, um, I think that that's a really, really great uh, marketing way is to do some cross promo yes <laughs> and just another question for you Georgia about uh, there's a few, couple of questions about music podcasts and how you deal with copyrights and uh, okay yeah so even at Broccoli we are we are in a JV with Sony Music however we still have to pay um copyright is you know it's it's, it's expensive um I would say start off with independent acts um, personally, I'm not talking on behalf of Broccoli, but I'm just saying um, start off with independent acts who would just appreciate the promo. Um, in regards to sound design, you don't necessarily want um, you don't necessarily want it to be too um, uh, what was it uh, decorated? Like you want it to be very basic anyway. In a in a podcast that's got talking in it um, you want it to be quite basic so if you're doing sound design you can use um is it epidemic sound and like there's loads of like free royalty free music where you can just use like um soundtracks and things like that for free um but if it's like an a, like a you know you want to feature stormzy that's going to be really expensive um and if it's like a real must um you can ask um, and see whether he'll allow you, but he may charge you. Uh, but I think starting up, you know, music is not free. And we understand that the music industry, if you're in the music industry, you understand that it's always under the under attack anyway. You know, people, artists, they don't get very much money from Spotify. They don't get very much money from all of these music streaming um, companies so you know every little penny counts and if you're playing their music and it's for free and you're playing the whole track that's a bit mean because somebody can just come into your podcast and, and just listen to the whole track and they don't need to buy the song uh, so think about it like that but I understand that it feels like there's a block um, but yeah I guess 
I, I would just say start with independent artists yeah okay there's a very specific question for georgia i can see here which is about how you is it best to interview people on zoom for podcasts and ask contributors to record their answers on their own phone did you cover this i can't remember no. <laughs> or yeah you... well so i mentioned the fact that we well this is how i often do it is that i will um if i'm not going to use say zencaster or or that they're not able to do that because you have to use a laptop to use Encaster as well what I'll do is I'll say right can we speak on zoom and this is also a good way to back up your audio if you're recording on zoom and then they're recording on their end on their phone or a second device it means that if anything does happen if the internet drops out or the reception isn't great or whatever and it sounds a bit crack crackly you're going to get some great audio because they've recorded it on their phone. The only issue is that obviously they could turn around and maybe they don't like the interview and they could turn around and say, I'm not going to send it to you. But that's why we always back it up. So if we're recording on, on Zoom, then we've obviously got that, that secondary audio, audio as well. Um, but yeah, a lot of the time people obviously will send it to you. Um, so you don't have to worry too much about that. But yeah, I think that that's probably the best way to do it because one, you've got a backup if anything happens. And two, you're going to get great audio from the fact that they've, they've recorded it all on their phone. So. And there's a couple of ones about tips for recording audio outside and then recording you know getting the best audio quality you can any any thoughts on that um i would say with recording outside you want to get yourself some kind of muff so they've got different names sometimes they're called a dead kitten so they're little which is not a very nice name actually is it but you know the little fluffy things that you get to put over your mic um wind noise is your worst enemy like i can i cannot tell you enough like wind noise you cannot get rid of it uh, it's very difficult to get rid of in production some things you can get rid of in production and that's fine um but with like a repetitive noise or wind you just can't get rid of it so either you want to place yourself where you know that you're not going to get any wind noise if you're by a road you want to make sure that maybe you move towards somewhere that's a little bit quieter in the worst case scenario and you cannot move then you want to make sure that your back is to the traffic so it's behind you and you've got the mic in front of you that way you're shielding any of that outside noise um, but yeah get yourself some kind of muff um, and then make sure that that is covering your speaker so that when you're interviewing people that's gonna hopefully filter through the wind noise and you're going to get the best quality of audio I would say in, in that sense yeah great uh, laura's just asked an interesting question jaja about um wants to hear a bit more about the equality and audio pact of broccoli and uh the question for all three of you what changes do you want to see in the podcasting audio industry this year okay so the equality in audio pact was something that renee richardson set up well we all at Broccoli and a few other participating production companies um, set up um, together. But Renee is basically the advocate, like the biggest advocate for it because she's been shouting the loudest about it with not much support. And um, we all know that the audio industry in general is uh, lacking diversity, like severely. Um, and um, it's, it's something that needs to change now um, immediately. Um, what she said, she, um, what more would you like to hear? Um, there's a website and um, there's a website, equalityandaudiopact.com. Um, if you have, uh, signed up, great. Um, the BBC actually did sign up, which was amazing. Um, but yeah, there's not much to explain. It needs to be diverse. We need to see each other. Like I would like to see more of me, um, in you know, at Radio 4, I was the only black person and I was a researcher, um, actually a broadcast assistant. Um, you know, I was the only black person right at the time, you know, and I'm not here to like, you know, what do they call it? They, they you know, I'm not here to get any, um, you know, I don't want anyone to feel sorry for me. I just want, you know, there's many people who are um, out here doing the work, working hard and, just need to be recognized um I'm, there's not really much to say equality in audio there's not really much to say um and any changes we all want to see well again it's just representation if you don't see somebody that looks like yourself you know there's 
there's there's so many different ethos about like psychology and what you see is what you can do so if if i see myself i'm going to want to do that i saw myself in um yeah different avenues and um, whether it's music radio and then i saw that there weren't many people I, there was i don't think that there's been one full-time black producer black female producer on the today program and i would like to see that that would be nice but what stress would she be able to what would what stress would she be under um being very honest because we know these environments are very toxic anyway um but yeah i just want to see everybody everywhere i think um, the LGBTQIA um, community is so underrepresented in the industry also um, and access, ex, like people with accessibility um, factors as well. Yeah, I'd like to see everybody everywhere really and truly. Do you have, what would you like to see, what change would you like to see in the industry this year, podcasting industry? Yeah, I think I'd uh, follow Jar Jar's lead there and say, Diversity of representation is incredibly important. I think media companies are trying a little bit more now. It'd be good to see them do more. Um, it'd be great to see different people from all different backgrounds uh, having the opportunity to do different things. I think the one thing I would say, look, it's really easy for me um, in this podcast, Moscow, to give out tips and say, look, you should do this, you should do this. Um, this is how you make a podcast really easy. Ultimately, the reason why our podcast was a success is because we had huge backing from one of the biggest broadcasters on the planet. We had um, between the three of us, millions of followers on social media, it makes the whole thing a lot easier um, when you've got that. And what I would like to see is more independent podcasts, people in their bedrooms, just giving it a go and doing really well because there is the scope to do that. It's wonderful when you see people who have literally just come up with an idea together with a few friends, decide to do a podcast and it does really well. And I'd love to see more of that. And I'd love to see the barriers to entry come down. It, it shouldn't be podcasts from a select few people in the media bubble it would be great to get different people from different podcasts from different backgrounds doing podcasts because good content comes from different groups and that's how you get a more representative feel across the entire genre is when you get different people participating in it absolutely and georgia what about about you what change would you like to see i'll keep it um short and concise otherwise i'll go on a bit of a rant um <laughs> i'd like to see less celebrity podcasts and more podcasts about real people and real people's lives i know that's a little bit controversial there's a lot of them out there at the moment believe me but i would rather hear about just normal people and when i say normal people people that i would have gone to school with people that i would have grown up with i grew up in a very working class place i went to school with you know diverse students i went to i was around people that are not what we currently see a lot of the time represented in the media industry and in the podcast industry and for me it's you know echoing both what jaja said and she have is that it's so important that all of us feel represented in the people that present podcasts the people that produce them the people that report on them you know if you've got an lgbtq plus podcast that's being produced and none of the producers working on it are from that community you're not going to get authentic stories you're not going to get an authentic experience and you're going to listen to it and straight away you're going to be able to tell that that's not made by people that understand that community or that audience and so I really feel like when producers and presenters um, are from that community or understand what they're talking about you can you can just tell straight away and that comes across in in the content that you make and it sounds authentic and it sounds real and it's so important that everyone has a place at the table because you can tell when people have not Make, you know, if you've got a room full of people that are all from the same background and haven't had to live certain lives or had to go through certain struggles, they're probably not going to be thinking about that on a daily basis when they're making content and they're creating stuff. They're not going to be sitting there thinking, oh, actually, I should probably make something for this community of people or we should probably should do a story that is important to that person. Um, so for me, it's like we need more people represented around the table and as you know both um, both the other panelists have said like it's so important that people one it, you're, you've got diversity in your producers but also you've got diversity on your on-air people as well and we we need to nurture on-air talent and make sure that we're putting the right people forward to be able to to present and front these podcasts I think. Well, that seems a very good place to end because that's absolutely what the John Schofield Trust is trying to do. 
Act is trying to increase diversity in on air or fair. Um, and yes, it is very much needed. Thank you so much to all of uh, Shihab and Georgia and Jaja who have all given up their time tonight to us uh, for free. And um, I hope it's been an, in uh, sorry we couldn't answer all the questions, but I was trying to group them together so that we would get as many as possible of the themes covered at least. If anyone has any extra questions as well, we're on Twitter, follow us, yeah. send yeah. us a DM, we'll answer your questions if you've got any extra stuff that you want me to ask. Good point. Thanks a lot. And um, anybody keep an eye open. We've got a big event next month, um, which is about media freedom. So keep your eye out for that. And thank you very much. Good night. Thanks all. Have a nice evening.